Welcome to Lennar's first quarter earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Alexandra Lumpkin for the reading of the forward-looking statement. Thank you and good morning. Today's conference call may include forward-looking statements, including statements regarding Lennar's business, financial condition, results of operations, cash flows, strategies, and prospects. Forward-looking statements represent only Lennar's estimates on the date of this conference call and are not intended to give any assurance as to actual future results. Because forward-looking statements relate to matters that have not yet occurred, these statements are inherently subject to risks and uncertainties. Many factors could affect future results and may cause Lennar's actual activities or results <coughs> to differ materially from the activities and results anticipated in forward-looking statements. These factors include those described in yesterday's press release and our SEC filings, including those under the caption, Risk Factors, contained in Lennar's annual report on Form 10-K, most recently filed with the SEC. Please note that Lennar assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements. I would now like to introduce your host, Mr. Stuart Miller, Executive Chairman. Sir, you may begin. Great, and good morning, and thank you, everyone. Uh, this morning, I'm here in Miami as the world is seemingly beginning to normalize with a scaled down and still socially distanced crew that includes Diane Bissett, our Chief Financial Officer, David Collins, our now Vice President and Controller, Bruce Gross, uh, CEO of uh, Lennar Financial Services, and of course, Alex, who you just heard from, uh, Rick Beckwith, our Chief, uh, Co-Chief Executive Officer and Co-President is in Colorado, and John Jaffe, our co-chief executive officer and co-president is in California, and they're on the line this morning as well. So today we have a lot of ground to cover. I'll give a macro and strategic Lennar overview. Rick will talk about market strength, land and community count, and John will update supply chain, production, and construction costs. And as usual, Diane will give detailed financial information, highlights, and additional guidance. Then we'll attempt to answer as many of your questions as possible. Uh, as always, please limit your questions to one question per customer and one follow-up. So <clears throat> from a macro perspective, the housing market remains strong. Demand has continued to strengthen as the millennial generation, which had previously postponed its entry into the housing market, has now continued to drive family formation while at the same time the supply of new and existing homes remains constrained. Even though interest rates have moved higher, at the same time that home prices have moved higher, overall affordability remains strong. Interest rates are still lower than they were a year ago, and personal savings for deposits are strengthening. Many American families have fortified savings as vacations and recreational activities have been canceled or postponed, and stimulus money from the government continues to fill the remaining gaps. The American dream of home ownership is an essential aspiration of the American population, and the seemingly uh, imminent resolution of the pandemic is not slowing the growing demand. Apartment dwellers can today afford a first-time home, and demand is strong and growing. Yesterday's first-time homes are selling quickly and at higher prices, enabling first-time move-ups. The market for yesterday's move-up home is strong and enabling customers to consider the, and purchase a larger home with a larger yard, with an office, a nicer kitchen, and a new set of necessary spaces for an evolving market. Also, the iBuyer and single-family for rent participants are providing additional liquidity to the marketplace to sell and purchase homes as they evolve and provide ever more frictionless transactions. The underproduction of homes for the past 10 years has created a housing shortage, and with strong demand, home prices are moving higher. Although this reality is exacerbating the well-documented affordability crisis across the country, as workforce housing is limited and getting more expensive, the solution, it seems, Will be, in the growing supply by in, will be in growing supply by building more housing. Current conditions 
have given rise to strong pricing power, strong though controlled sales pace, certainly labor and material increases, very strong gross margins and even stronger net margins, and of course the challenge of land scarcity. In the context of overall market conditions, Lenar's first quarter results reflect the intersection of our clearly stated strategic focus with excellent operational performance. Let me connect the dots. We have stated consistently that we would remain focused on orderly, targeted growth and maintain our sales pace tightly matched with our pace of production. We actively managed growth at the top line in favor of even greater growth at the bottom line. We focused on gross margin, margin by harvesting pricing power and controlling costs while building a better mousetrap, as I've called it, in order to reduce our SG&A. We have focused on cash flow, debt reduction, and stock buyback, land owned versus controlled, return on capital and on equity, and of course, innovative technologies. All of this strategic focus shows through in our first quarter results. We grew our deliveries 19% year over year and grew revenues 18%, which drove a pre-tax income before extraordinary items at, at uh, to an increase of 95% year over year, and an after-tax pre-extraordinary items income and EPS increase of 61%. To achieve this, we've controlled sales pace and matched it with production. And while some have questioned our controlled and managed sales pace, the virtue of that strategy has been borne out by our 25% first quarter gross margin versus 20.5% last year. At the same time, we've remained focused on improving our operating efficiency, driving our SG&A down, uh, SG down to a first quarter all-time low of 8.4% versus 9.2% last year, and driving our net margin to 16.6% this year versus 11.4% last year. Alongside our home building operations, our financial services group has continued to exceed all expectations as well. While some of the remarkable $146 million of earnings contribution from this segment is capital markets driven in today's market environment, much of the consistent performance beat from this group continues to be driven by constant work and rework of the cost structure. Lenar Financial Services continues to be a leader in the drive to create a better experience for our customers at a lower cost to transact. <clears throat> While operations have performed extremely well, we have also further improved our balance sheet. Rick will discuss our land program and our single family for rent program, which, will, uh, which, have, uh, which continue to drive balance sheet improvements. And just as you've seen dramatic improvement in other, facets of, in other facets of our business, just in time delivery of land and just in time delivery of completed homes enables us to be laser focused on our inventory turn and we'll be reporting on progress in that area in coming quarters. Of course, all of our work has strategically focused attention on our returns on equity and returns on capital, which have improved year over year by 470 and 420 basis points, respectively. And Diane will give more detail uh, and our guidance in her comments. <clears throat> so moving on, uh, in addition to the solid operating performance that we, we reported this quarter, we also had an extraordinary item of note. We have been talking about the strength of our Lenex technology platform, and this quarter, Lenex requires some additional discussion. Let me start by noting the remarkable contribution of Eric Fader and his team, led by Sana Khan and Christian Falk at Lenex. We have learned from scratch how to be a constructive, strategic investor in disruptive or adaptive technology companies through trial, and er through trial and error together with study and engagement, and we have learned quite a lot. 
this group has learned how to balance both the tip of the spear in engaging best of breed entrepreneurs and innovators and the soft touch required to engage and bridge change management together with our operating leaders within the company. Great work, team. With that said, last quarter we daylighted that Opendoor, one of our many Lenex technology business investments, would begin trading as a public company and would require mark-to-market gain recognition. recognition. <clears throat> Accordingly, Opendoor is now a public company and we recorded a $470 million profit as a result. While this gain is extraordinary relative to our operating platform, it is not a one-time event for the company. Through Lenex, we have invested in a number of high-quality technology businesses that are changing the way business is transacted, is transacted in our company and in the housing business in general. Two more of our Lenex investment companies, DOMA, previously known as State's Title, and Hippo Home Insurance, have both announced pending SPAC combinations. Additionally, as we have recently announced, our Sun Street Solar Power Company will be acquired by Sonova Energy. Given our ownership interest in these companies <clears throat> and understanding that we might or might not qualify for mark-to-market accounting treatment, we are conservatively estimating an economic gain in excess of a billion dollars from these companies. Additionally, we believe that other companies in our technology portfolio will mature over time as well. While some have questioned the heat in the technology market space, our Lenex investments are not driven by the one-time gains that might capture attention. Instead, our Lenex investments are focused on best-of-breed management teams that are building solutions to important problems that are adjacent to our core home building and financial services businesses. These companies, their solutions, and their form of execution are models for us to learn, participate with, and re-engineer our own operating platform for improved performance. Our investment focus prioritizes the return to our operating platform over our outsized return on our investment. Although the gains can be sizable and positively impact our earnings and balance sheet, they are, more importantly, indicative of the maturity and relevance of the underlying management and business. And while they are subject to the up and down fluctuations of stock market movements, the part of our investment that is not subject to market fluctuations is the permanent impact to our operating platform and company performance. Each of these companies have meaningfully impacted our core operating platform. Let me give some examples. Opendoor pioneered the iBuyer space. We invested and participated in molding and evolving this business. We learned that the iBuyer space can reshape the entire home transaction, especially a move-up transaction. As this solution continues to evolve and mature, the iBuyer sale will become an industry standard as seamless, trustworthy, and timed for the customer's convenience becomes an expected way of transacting in the home buying world. For Lennar, Open Door ignited an, intern, an internal digital marketing transformation that altered our entire customer acquisition and engagement. We both learned from them and then began to teach ourselves. We changed. And as a direct result, we significantly reduced SG&A by reducing selling, marketing, and outside realtor costs and enabling better coordinated closings for us and for our purchasers. DOMA, formerly State's Title, is pioneering the instant digital home and mortgage closing. The conventional process of title insurance underwriting and traditional escrow closing is confusing to the customer, time-consuming for lenders, and time-consuming for lenders, builders, and customers alike. DOMA is simply working to reduce a 14-day work stream to 14 minutes. 
by eliminating the traditional process, a buyer dashboard and seamless customer interface will affect an instant closing with one-tap convenience. This eliminates time and risk for the lenders, uh, reduces complexity for the customer, and reduces costs for all parties involved. Lenore became a shareholder in DOMA by selling our retail title business for debt and equity in the company. Lenore's retail platform and title underwriter became a springboard for DOMA's growth and evolution. For Lenore, we simplified, allowing our team to focus all of their attention on just our captive business. Our operation and overall operating costs were reduced significantly, helping, helping to drive Lenore Financial Services' bottom line. Hippo Insurance has pioneered an instant and personalized home insurance product. Home insurance histori historically has required a detailed application process that resulted in a one-size-fits-all, overly expensive insurance policy. <clears throat> Hippo uses big data and technology to gather detailed information on each home, deliver a refined policy at a lower cost, and with coverage for what matters most to the customer. The process is simple and frictionless. Lenore invested in Hippo by joint venturing our captive home insurance agency and investing additional dollars over time. This investment enabled us to participate in the development of the Hippo product for the new home market, add design elements to the home, like security by ring and flow by Moen water shutoff valve that lowers home insurance rates, and design the engagement for the new home buyer. Today, Hippo underwrites every Lennar home before the purchase. Our customer simply opts in to hear from Hippo, and they will get an immediate quote. Hippo has already done all the work. Lennar participates in the agency fee with no overhead, and thus simplifying Lennar Financial Services once again and enhancing our bottom line. Finally, we have recently announced that we will sell our Sun Street Solar operations to Sonova in exchange for stock in the company. We built the Sun Street platform to install solar panels on every Lennar home in certain markets where it was feasible. We built a blue chip, chip team that excels at installations for production new homes as opposed to retrofit. The Sun Street platform is readily expandable and we expect Sonova will effectively grow that business. Lenar will benefit by simplifying our business and partnering with Sonova to take standard solar insta installations and turn communities into microgrids with battery storage, generators, and advanced arbitrage technology. We expect to develop next generation energy solution for new homes and communities that will solve the problem of power outages and electric grid deficiencies for new communities. We look forward to working with Sonova, the Sonova team who specializes in this space to solve the critical problem of energy generation and distribution in an environmentally efficient manner. Simply put, Lenar is a very different company. We are no longer just a home building company with technology operating in the background. We are now a focused, technology aware and technology engaged home builder that incorporates effective and new technology solutions to enhance our core operations and our product offerings. We invest in technology companies and professionals we work along, alongside them to develop products for our industry. We incorporate new ways of doing business, and we profit as well by investing in world-class innovators and entrepreneurs that help, help illuminate our path forward. To the investor world, we would not make the case that a higher EPS from non-operating income, or loss for that matter, should be used with our multiple to value our company. But instead, I would make the case and will make the case over time for multiple expansion as our focus on cash flow and returns together with an improving operating platform 
with embedded upside from strategic investments merits consideration. Now, before I turn over to Rick, let me briefly turn to our ancillary business divisions and our drive to focus on our core home building and financial services businesses. We have continued to drive and grow our excellent ancillary business divisions, and they continue to mature. But being simpler enables us to focus on our core business units ever more. As noted in past conference calls, we have been working on strategies to better position our multifamily business called LMC, along with our now maturing SFR or single family for rent business that Rick will talk about in a minute. Additionally, we have a dynamic and growing land program and land management business. We have also LMF, Lenar Mortgage Finance, our commercial mortgage business, another excellent business. And finally, we have a growing technology investment business, which is part of Lenex. We've concluded that the best way to enhance corporate value is to have Lennar stand alone as a pure play home builder and financial services company, and to enable these, these blue chip businesses to thrive and excel independently. Therefore, we are working to construct a tax-free spinoff of all or parts of these ongoing businesses in a unified company. This SPINCO may contain all or part of the assets of these businesses together with certain land assets and programs as well as part of our Lenex investment business. The expected size of the spun enterprise would be between three and five billion dollars in asset base with no debt which our balance sheet can comfortably accommodate. The remaining Lennar would see almost no loss of operating income from this spinoff and will continue to have a very liquid balance sheet. The standalone company uh, would ultimately drive income from significant asset management fees. The SPINCO will be focused on building an active asset management business that raises third-party capital to support ongoing business verticals included in land including land development. The company will become an active asset and property management company. The backbone for the company will be LMC's operating platform together with the LMV structures. The, uh, the resolu this resolution is no longer a long-term strategy but is immediate as we focus on driving higher returns with less noise in our numbers from lumpy profits and losses, which will increase visibility for the capital markets into our core operations. Expect to hear a lot more about this spin over the next quarters as our thinking matures. Today, we can only give a brief sketch of the future of this program. I know you will thirst for more detail, but we're not in a position to give it at this time. But we did feel that it was time to share our thinking with the investment world as we work to fill out the detail and build a new company. So in conclusion, let me say that our results and our expectations for the year are solid in all respects and they reflect our focused strategy to balance growth and bottom, drive bottom line, margin, cash flow, and returns. But complementing our business performance, we continue to, be foc to focus on our broader mission of making the world around us even better. Whether it's with our social focus on extending home ownership to a broader social and economic array of customers with our emerging single family for rent program, which Rick will discuss shortly, or our $1,000 per home that we contribute to our Lennar Foundation for social, health, and educational programs across the country, or our solar initiative for better and more sustainable energy for our homes, we are positioned to do well, but always focused on doing good. At Lennar, we have never been better positioned financially, organizationally, culturally, and technologically to thrive and grow in this evolving and exciting housing market. 
With that, let me turn over to Ray. Thanks, Stuart. As you can tell from Stuart's opening comments, the housing market is very strong, our team is extremely well coordinated, and our financial results continue to benefit from a solid execution of our core operating strategies. Key to that has been running a finely tuned home building machine where we carefully match home building starts with sales on a community by community basis. In this environment, it makes no sense to sell too far out ahead because you lose the ability to offset potential cost increases with sales price increases. Our first quarter results prove out the success of this strategy. In the quarter, both new orders and starts were up 26% over the prior year, enabling an orderly construction program and a just-in-time delivery of, of completed homes. This sales and production focused program allowed us to drive a 450 basis point improvement in our gross margins year over year with strong results in each month of the quarter. In the first quarter, new orders, deliveries, gross margins were up strongly in each of our operating regions. In addition, we saw strength in all product categories from entry level to move up to our active adult communities. The strength of the market was also reflected in a historically low cancellation rate, which was 9.6% in the quarter, down 450 basis points from last year. This is additional evidence that buyers have the required down payment and mortgage qualifications to purchase a new home, and they have little desire to risk canceling their new home purchase due to the risk of rising sales prices. As Stuart mentioned, technology-driven innovation and a focus on process has significantly lowered our SG&A. This has been reflected in each of our operating regions with net margins up across the board in every region. Now I'd like to spend a few moments talking about growth and community count. As expected, our community count at the end of the first quarter was down 8% from the prior year. Notwithstanding the 8% decline, we achieved a 26% increase in new orders in the first quarter, driven by a 45% increase in sales per community. While part of the increase in absorption pace was driven by improved market conditions, part of it was due to the fact that we had been targeting larger higher volume entry level communities that can deliver more homes per month than smaller communities. In the next several quarters, our growth will continue to come from an overall higher absorption pace, as well as an increase in community count, and we are still on track to increase our active communities by about 10% in fiscal 2021, with the increase coming in the back half of the year. While we continue to be focused on our community count, we are intensely focused on replacing our existing communities with larger, higher volume communities, as this allows us to better leverage our overhead, improve our bottom line, and increase our returns and cash flow. As I've mentioned on prior calls, improving our returns on capital and reducing our balance sheet, our on balance sheet investment in land is a top priority. With that in mind, we have been laser focused on increasing our percentage of auction home sites and reducing our year's supply of owned home sites, all while increasing our overall home site supply. During the first quarter, we made significant process on all of these fronts, as our controlled home site percentage increased 1,400 basis points year over year and 600 basis points sequentially to end the first quarter at 45%. In addition, our year's own supply of home sites dropped to 3.4 years from four years in the year ago period and 3.5 years sequentially. Most importantly, we increased our total controlled and owned home sites by approximately 37,000 home sites in the quarter, with approximately 95% of these being optioned or controlled home sites. Based on this progress, we are in excellent position to achieve our goals of 50% controlled home sites and a three-year owned supply by the end of fiscal 2021. 
These improvements reflect the strength of our relationships with local developers and other strategic partners. We've been building a just-in-time delivery system for our land inventory that we believe is sustainable throughout the cycles. We've created relationships with developers and investors with appetites for different duration risk for land and have matched that duration risk with appropriate risk-adjusted returns. These short-term land and long-term land programs will allow us to continue to strengthen our balance sheet while generating strong margins and increased returns on capital. Consistent with our land light strategy and a focus on increased profitability and returns, we are excited to expand our business through the creation of a first-of-its-kind single-family rental platform that will facilitate a better time delivery of our homes with reduced cycle times. Following this earnings call, we will formally announce the formation of the Upward America Venture. This business will initially be capitalized with a total equity commitment of $1.25 billion led by Centerbridge Partners alongside Allianz Real Estate and other high-quality institutional investors. Including leverage, the venture will be positioned to acquire over $4 billion of new single-family homes and townhomes from Lennar. We expect Lennar's peak capital investment to be $50 million in the, in the Upward America venture. This venture is uniquely positioned to quickly scale given its direct access to Lennar's pipeline of both purpose-built single-family communities and scattered single-family homes that meet the, invest the venture's investment criteria. The initial pipeline of purpose-built communities for this venture includes approximately 3,000 homes in 27 communities with a total purchase price of approximately $900 million. Like our multifamily build to core business, this platform will be asset managed by Lennar with third-party equity and debt owning the assets in an asset light program for Lennar. As housing needs and demographics continue to evolve, we believe that the single-family rental sector will continue to outperform. In addition, the Upward America Venture continues Lennar's vision of becoming an ESG-driven home building company by making our high-quality homes not only available for sale, but also for rent, with a portion of the homes available with a rent-to-own option. The vehicle social focus provides a unique opportunity for families and individuals across the country to live in brand new Lennar homes at an attainable price point, all without putting up a down payment. Given this, we have a distinct opportunity to create upward mobility in the housing market through this initiative. Now I'd like to turn it over to John. Thank you, Rick, and good morning, everyone. As Rick and Stuart noted, matching sales pace with our production pace has been our consistent strategic focus that has enabled us to drive excellent performance. By pairing production and sales, we've maximized margins and driven bottom line profitability. In the current environment, we could have easily generated more sales, but our view has been and remains that the key to success in this market is all about managing the supply chain and production. I'd like to briefly describe our strategy, performance, and expectations for production and construction costs in order to shed some light on how this strategy has been central to our accomplishments this quarter and how it will impact the balance of 2021. First, let me share with you some statistics from our first quarter. Our total construction cost per square foot was down 0.7% in Q1 year over year but up 1.9% sequentially from the fourth quarter. In the first quarter, lumber costs increased about $1 per square foot, or $2,300 per home, both year over year and sequentially. These cost increases were more than offset by other cost decreases year over year, but not sequentially, resulting in the overall year over year cost decline and sequential cost increase. Year over year, our construction cost as a percent of average sales price decreased from 45% to 42% and remained flat sequentially as our pricing power, driven by our controlled sales pace, offset cost increases seen in our first quarter deliveries. Let me take a moment to discuss the situation with lumber and other supply chain challenges. As we all know, lumber is the largest, component, largest cost component of new home construction. 
It is well documented that the cost of lumber is at all-time highs as supply is limited and demand is high. We will see additional cost increases from lumber throughout the year with increases from today's all-time high lumber pricing starting with Q3 deliveries. Given the unprecedented pricing levels we've seen, it's challenging to predict how lumber prices will trend, but we're encouraged by the additional OSB capacity currently coming online and the lumber future markets indicating some relief. The overall production environment today is defined by a supply chain with limited to no excess inventory. Normally, the manufacturers that supply our industry carry 30 to 60 days of inventory and are able to adjust distribution to meet varying demand. However, Due to COVID-19 disruptions and manufacturing facilities in the U.S., Mexico, and overseas in 2020, that capacity has, at best, been dramatically reduced and, at worst, eliminated. At the same time, demand has increased from both new home construction and big box retailers. This situation makes the supply chain particularly vulnerable to further disruptions, such as the deep freeze that struck Texas last month. That storm shut down the plants that manufacture MDI and poly-based resins, impacting the manufacturing of OSB, paint, insulation, refrigerators, and other products. We're working closely with all of these affected manufacturers to ensure that we have the products we need being delivered to our job sites as we need them. To manage through these disruptions in the supply chain of materials, as well as to be the builder of choice in a continually constrained labor market, we employ the following strategies and processes. First, we remain disciplined about our everything's included approach, which simplifies the entire building process for our trades. We share data by providing frequent forecasts and open purchase order information. We simplify by rationalizing SKUs across multiple categories. We access alternative supply chain solutions and aggressively pre-buy materials as needed. Most importantly, we communicate. <laughs> Our trade partners know well in advance of our upcoming production needs. Our divisions know of extended manufacturing lead times in real time, and our national supply chain team, led by Kent Gillis, together with our regional purchasing VPs, are in constant communication with each other, our divisions, and all of our trade partners. I would best describe the production environment as challenged but manageable. In the first quarter, we saw a mild increase in our cycle time as we dealt with resolving issues as they presented themselves. And through our strong supply chain partnerships, we were largely able to overcome supply constraints. Our highest volume partners have given us expanded lead times, which we were able to accommodate due to our production first model, where our needs are forecasted several quarters out. We believe we're well positioned with our disciplined and production first process to continue to manage through new, ta new challenges as they present themselves. Our focus on these processes is why we are comfortable affirming our deliveries for the year. However, this environment is not easily stressed to allow for an increase in deliveries. So our focus is on maintaining our planned starts, deliveries, and maximizing margins. In conclusion, Lenore's strategy of a managed approach to production and sales pace produced great results in our first quarter. As we look to the balance of the year, we are confident that our gross margins will remain around 25% we will drive our SGNA lower, producing higher net margins and a stronger bottom line while maintaining our planned volume. And now I'll turn it over to Diane. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. Although you've heard some of our financial results from Stuart, Rick, and John, I'll begin by recapping certain of our Q1 2021 highlights and then provide detailed guidance for Q2 2021 mm -hmm. and high-level guidance for fiscal year 2021. So we'll start with home building. For new orders, we ended the quarter with new orders of 15,570, a 26% increase year over year. While this was the highest new order total for a quarter in our history, we continued to be focused on production first, matching sales and starts. In the first quarter, our starts were 15,982, also up 26% year over year. From a pace standpoint, our monthly sales pace was 4.5 for the quarter, matching our monthly starts pace of 4.6 for the quarter. We ended the quarter with 22,077 homes in backlog with a dollar value of $9.5 billion and ended with 1,162 active communities. Our cancellation rate was about 10%. For the quarter, deliveries totaled 12,314, up 19% year-over-year. 
Our gross margin was 25%, up 450 basis points from the prior year. This increase was primarily driven by a continued focus on attaining price increases while control, controlling and matching cost increases. In addition, we also had lower interest expense per home as a result of our continued paydowns of senior notes in the past several years and lower field expense per home due to a higher delivery volume. Our SG&A was 8.4%, down 80 basis points from the prior year. This improvement is primarily a result of our intense focus on incorporating technology to gain efficiencies across our home building platform. Our net margin for the quarter was 16.6%, the highest first quarter net margin ever achieved. Our financial services team also executed at high levels, reporting $146 million of operating earnings. Mortgage operating earnings increased to $100 million compared to $41 million in the prior year. Mortgage earnings benefited primarily from an increase in volume and lower cost per loan combined with an increase in secondary margins. Title operating earnings was $31 million compared to $10 million in the prior year. Title earnings increased primarily due to an increase in volume. We also started to realize upside from our, technology, techno, from our strategic technology investments in our Lennar Other segment. As Stuart mentioned, during the quarter, we recorded a $470 million mark-to-market gain on our open-door investment as a result of the company going public in December. The gain was based on open-door stock price at the end of our first quarter, which was 28.02. This investment will be marked to market at each quarter end based on open door stock price at that time. I also want to mention that we have a new line item on our P&L titled Charitable Foundation Contribution, which is the contribution to our Lennar Foundation. Previously, our annual contribution to the foundation was 1% of net income. Beginning with this year, 2021, we will be increasing our contribution to $1,000 per home delivered. And so just for a bit of perspective, using fiscal 2020 numbers, our net income last year was about $2.5 billion, which resulted in a contribution of about $25 million. If we had contributed at $1,000 per home level, our contribution would have been about $53 million. So the increase is significant, and we are very pleased and very proud to be able to give back even more to our communities, doing good while we do well. And then turning to the balance sheet, we ended the quarter with $2.4 billion of cash and no borrowings outstanding on our $2.5 billion revolving credit facility. We continue to focus on our strategy to become asset lighter by developing a just-in-time delivery system for land and homes improving returns, and generating increased home building cash flow. At quarter end, we owned 189,000 home sites and controlled 154,000 home sites. This resulted in our year supply owned decreasing to 3.4 years from 4.0 years in the prior year, and our home sites controlled increasing to 45% from 31% in the prior year. We continue to make progress, as Rick mentioned, in reaching our goal of three-year supply owned and 50% home sites controlled by the end of the year. During the quarter, we repurchased a small amount of shares, 510,000, for a total of 43 million. At quarter end, our home building debt to total cap was 24%, down from 33.6% in the prior year. And just a few final points on our balance sheet. Our stockholders' equity increased to approximately $19 billion from $16 billion in Q1 of the prior year. And our book value per share increased to $60.30 from $51.39 in the prior year. And finally, just a few weeks ago, we were upgraded by Fitch to triple B flat from triple B minus. This upgrade follows the upgrade to investment grade from Moody's that we received last November. We are quite pleased with the rating agency advances that we have achieved in recent months. So in summary, our balance sheet is very, thong, very strong. This balance sheet enables us to execute a spinoff, and even after that transaction, we will have a rock-solid balance sheet. And with that brief overview, let's turn to guidance. 
I'll first provide deca detailed guidance for the second quarter and then some high-level guidance for the fiscal year. So we'll start with home building. We expect Q2 new orders to be in the range of 16,500 to 16,700 homes, <coughs> and our Q2 deliveries will be in the range of 14,200 to 14,400 homes. Our Q2 average sales price should be around 405,000. As we mentioned, we expect to maintain our gross margin at about 25% for Q2, despite rising material and labor costs. We expect our Q2 SG&A to be in the range of 7.9 to 8% as we continue to focus on benefiting from technology efficiencies. And for the combined category of home building joint venture, land sales, and other, we expect a Q2 loss in the range of about 5 to 10 million. We believe our financial services earnings for Q2 will be in the range of 100 to 105 million. For our multifamily operations, we expect a loss in the range of 5 to 10 million. And for the Lennar other category, we also expect, expect a loss in the range of 5 to 10 million. Now remember that this guidance for Lennar other does not include any potential mark to market gains on our HIPPO or state's title DOMA investment. We have not yet concluded if we will be able to utilize mark to market accounting for these investments. And if we do, the gain will be determined by the stock price of each company at the end of our second quarter. Additionally, this guidance does not include any potential adjustments to our current open door investment, since this too will be determined by the stock price of open door at the end of our second quarter. And lastly, the guidance does not include a gain related to the sale of our Sun Street Solar Company, since the shares that we will receive as consideration will be valued at Sonova's closing price on the date that the transaction closes. We expect our Q2 corporate G&A to be about 1.5% of total revenue. And as I mentioned, our charitable foundation contribution will be based on $1,000 per home delivered during the quarter. We expect our tax rate to be about 24.5%, and the weighted average share count for the quarter should be approximately <laughs> 311 million shares. And so when you pull all this together, this guidance should produce an EPS range of $2.25 to $2.35 per share for the quarter. And so now let me provide some guidance for the fiscal year. We still expect to deliver between 62,000 and 64,000 homes, but with now higher gross margin guidance of about 25% for the year and an even more efficient operating platform with SG&A guidance of 7.6 to 7.8 for the year. And we believe our average sales price for the year will be about 400000 And our financial services earnings will be in the range of 445 to $460 million. And finally, our tax rate should be about 24%. And so as we continue to ex execute our core operating strategies, maintain a very strong balance sheet, and remain focused on cash flow generation and returns, we are well positioned for another excellent year. And so with that, let me turn it over to the operator for questions. Thank you. We would now like to begin the question and answer session of today's conference. We ask that you limit your questions to one question and one follow-up question until all the questions have been answered. If you would like to ask a question, please unmute your phone, press star 1, and record your name clearly when prompted. If you need to withdraw your question, you may use star 2. Again, that is star 1 to ask a question. And our first question comes from Truman Patterson with Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, Wow, uh, a, a lot of uh, detail on the call. And um, Stuart, I feel like you're uh, baiting me to ask a question about the spin code, but but I'm going to refrain for now. Um, so so <laughs> no. So first question on um, on the gross margin guidance. You all bumped it up to 25 percent. That that implies flat sequentially throughout the year, when normally we see you know sequential improvement. Um, due to leverage as we move through the year. C could you just uh, let us know what your expectations are for, you know, land, labor, material inflation is as we move through the year? And, uh, you know, does this imply, since it's, you know, um, flat gross margin through the year, does this imply that some of your internal efficiencies are starting to level off or 
pricing you assume is cooling? Just walk us through some of the moving parts there, please. Well, let me just start as uh, Rick and John collect their thoughts on that question. Um, but uh, just remember, uh, Truman, that um, uh, our guidance on, uh, on margin uh, was pretty consistent through the year at between uh, 23.5 to 24-ish percent. Um, and so we're upping our guidance. It was flat through the year, recognizing <clears throat> that along the way and through the year, uh, some of the construction costs would, um, would rise and would uh, pull through at different parts of the year. Um, so th this, is, this is consistent with how we were thinking um, at the beginning of the year in terms of the way the w year would shape up, shape up, even with, as you say, um, uh, the leverage embedded in uh, increased um, volume as you go quarter by quarter. Um, so what you're seeing is, is, is significant improvement um, that we're reflecting in each quarter's uh, results. Uh, uh, John, Rick, do you want to uh, add some color to the, uh, the way that margin shaping up? Sure. Uh, this is John. You know, as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, uh, you know, lumber is the, the biggest mover on the cost side of the equation. And uh, we'll see in Q2 um, more of an impact from lumber prices as they were spiking um, in like October of 2020. And so I said we have about a $2,300 per home increase um, in our lumber cost in Q1. Um, that will go up by about another four or 5000 per home as we, as we move into Q2. And then in Q3 and Q4, we'll see a repeat of that pattern as lumber prices you know, have moved higher in the recent months um, before what we hope will be an expected leveling off. So as you know, all of us have mentioned, uh, we've got significant pricing power that's overcoming um, that, that big needle mover of the lumber cost increases. That's just a reflection of where the lumber market is, um, not, not something that any of us can do anything about until the, the market itself corrects. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, we're seeing other cost increases, other categories, as uh, there is uh, supply constraint and increased demand, just sort of natural su supply and demand that's occurring in the supply chain. Yeah, I think that Stuart and John have covered it. You know, I, I view this as we we bump overall year guidance by 125 basis points. Uh, so we, we feel that that's a, a really big increase, you know, from a quarter yeah. ago. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree with that. Um, and uh, apologies if I missed I, I missed the first part of the call. So apologies if I ask uh, something that was covered earlier on. But it, clearly, it sounds like demand is healthy. But uh, on the flip side, you know, uh, are you seeing any demand softening with the recent increase uh, in rates? And I'm trying to link this to uh, your, your two Q orders guide. Seems like it's below what we would expect seasonally, right, sequentially. Um, uh, you know, is this just you all are comfortable running your mousetrap uh, at this level and you're fine with demand outstripping, you know, supply? Or, or are you concerned um, of the market softening near term? Um, and, you know, with that, your guidance was about 16.6 thousand orders or starts, I would estimate. Is that the level that you all are comfortable uh, you can produce going forward. Right. So as John said in his commentary, we could get we could have sales be whatever we wanted. The market is extremely strong in all price and product categories. And what we've really been focused on is matching starts with sales and making sure that we are maximizing our bottom line through operating efficiencies. And you know, we, we've, we've looked at what some of the other builders have done in selling so far out ahead, and without the ability to match a price increase to cover a cost that may be potentially come in, it just doesn't make business sense for us. So we're sticking to our plan and feel very good about what we've laid out for you. Yeah, and, you know, look, we're managing a carefully controlled business, and as you, you heard from the, the earnings call and our commentary today. We have a number of moving parts in the company. We've been focusing on balancing margin and bottom line and cash flow and really building that rock-solid balance sheet. 
I know that you hesitated, and I ask everyone to hesitate in asking questions about the spin, um, but the balance sheet is really the key to spinning and leaving both companies with rock-solid balance sheets. And uh, all of this comes about through a carefully managed program of matching starts, production, and sales, uh, and keeping them in orderly uh, relationship to each other. And that's exactly what you've seen from the company um, as we map out our strategy for going forward. Next Absolutely. question. Thank you. you Thank you. Our next question comes from Stephen Kim from Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks very much, guys. Uh, you've certainly been busy. Uh, good to see. Uh, and we'll be looking forward to a lot more information coming forward. Um, I did want to ask you generally, though, about Lenx, uh, which I understand is Len to the X power. But um, you know, I see two potential approaches, um, and I'm curious which is more the priority for you, which, which is really more the emphasis that is sort of driving your decision making, or will drive your decision making around the Lenx. You know, one would be to create you know, a separate operating segment of sorts in order to have a collection of businesses be more easily valuable by the street, you know, literally able to be valued, you know, more easily. Um, but then another alternative would be to, that you want to create an ecosystem, an ecosystem of tech-enabled businesses that a customer enters into when they walk into one of your sales centers or one of your rental offices um, in order to uh, sort of maximize the value that you can – uh, both provide and get compensated for by that customer. And I'm wondering which was more the priority or is more the priority in your mind? And, uh, and then uh, as a follow-up, you know, do we consider, should we consider these initiatives to be cash flow positive or negative meaningfully over the next few years at all? <clears throat> so uh, fair question, Steve. <clears throat> Our primary focus in building Linux, um, and it has been evolutionary, uh, has been the latter approach. Um, it was and continues to be all about, um, in the background of our core business, we inject uh, these new streams of activity uh, that are uh, enabling a better customer experience and better cost structure for our company. I've called it and said it's building a better mousetrap. Uh, and if you think about the companies we've talked about, um, over time, uh, you know, you could, you could imagine that a customer walks in and says, I've got a home to sell. We've got a solution. It's the iBuyer space. And that leads right into a blend-powered mortgage application, which is a seamless, simpler, technology-enabled uh, uh, mortgage application uh, feeding right into DOMA and a, uh, you know, the, 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 the entire closing process being one tap and digitized uh, and an immediate home insurance policy, it becomes a joyful experience with our technology companies operating in the background, creating an excellent experience for our customer, but driving our cost structure down and enabling us to build profitability and even pass on some of those savings to our customers, which is a greater good. And I, I, I haven't really mentioned that each of our technology companies has an ESG component and focus as well, and that will develop over time. So really think about it as we're building a better Lennar by investing in these technology companies, and the investment in the technology company, uh, we're not really isolating and looking at as a separate operating business. Um, and I, would, I, I just want to daylight that Eric Fader and his team um, of Sonicon, Christian Falk, and a number of others have really developed some expertise in creating a focus on technology companies that matter together with change management uh, dovetailed within the company. Um, and I think that over time, what you're going to see is these companies develop their own value proposition, as you've already started to see. They do become cash flow positive in their own right, um, and each of them has a map to that strategy. Um, and the dovetail with Lennar and the operating performance is what gets us very enthusiastic. So we're more focused on the latter approach than we are on the former. And we really want to de-emphasize what I call the shiny object of, of you know, the big gains 
And I want to emphasize more the, the, the core programs that Rick is involved in, John's involved in, Eric's involved in, I'm involved in every single day of building a better company. That's what it's really about. That's great. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Stuart. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, the second, second thing I wanted to ask about um, relates to this uh, land venture um, which you talked a little bit about in your 10K and you talked a little bit about today. Rick, I believe you spoke to um, the idea that this would be creating a structure by which you can basically bucket land parcels into uh, various categories or categorize things into put them into buckets with different uh, durations and different uh, uh, returns on capital expectations. You know, to, in a way, though, that's kind of what you've always been doing, right? I mean, like home builders always, you know, what they're doing things properly are sort of evaluating parcels of land to, you know, for duration and returns on capital expectations and so forth. So is what's different here that you've got some form of a system that enables you to do that more quickly by isolating specific metrics or something? I don't want to put words in your mouth because I'll probably get it wrong, but can you but to the degree that there's already that discipline that existed in Lennar previously, can you zero in on exactly what is different and, and special about this particular relationship and venture? Well, let me start off and I'll let John follow. Um, you know, Steve, you're right. We have always done what we thought we could do to maximize, you know, the land opportunities out there, whether they be short-term or long-term. I think the key difference associated with this is we've created something that's very programmatic and systemized and oriented where we're matching capital and returns to either short dated and long dated land opportunities. And what we've learned as we've evolved our thinking over the last several years is that there is tremendous appetite out there in the market for risk adjusted returns. And, you know, the returns associated with a short-term sort of current inventory type of opportunity is, is a much lower threshold than something that, that is a, a little bit riskier. And by creating a programmatic, systemized machine where we funnel our land opportunities to either one of these programmatic structures, uh, it allows us to become very efficient and, and to to really incredibly scour the land opportunities out there uh, to, to, to grow our business. So, John, anything you want to add to that? Yes, Steve, I would just add that you know, perhaps the, 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 the fine-tuning of what we've always done has been to further define the, the, the risk buckets associated with land. So if you think about the, the least risky component, that's the land in which we're um, building homes on. And that should really be financed at the lowest cost of capital, you know, primarily our, our cash on hand or a revolver. Um, and then if you look at the next bucket and call it the land that is, is more like WIP, you know, in, that's ready to come into that production assembly line um, that's from, say, zero to four years out, um, that is properly structured relatively very low risk and should attract a cost of capital that is also very low and separated from sort of that midterm uh, bucket of land, which has historically looked for, you know, high teens to 20% kind of returns from, a, from an investment standpoint. And by properly structuring uh, and really reducing the significant portion of risk associated with that, that middle bucket, um, we're able to create, as Rick said, a more of a systemic approach um, that has significant uh, size and scale to it allowing for a sort of one-stop facility to be able to uh, make it very easy to transact um, and to really position uh, land to, to be de-risked. Great. I uh, appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this as we go forward. But thanks a lot, guys, and uh, good luck and uh, good job with everything so far. Steve, let me just, let me just say uh, before, you, before you get off that uh, it's really a just-in-time delivery system for land that we're building. But I love the fact that the question is coming from you, and I reminisce about you, me, David Dwyer, sitting in my old office going through this you know, kind of tranched risk-reward uh, association relative to CMBS uh, probably 25 years ago. And 
here we are going through that same thinking process again as it relates to another asset class. Yeah, indeed. And uh, I imagine that the returns from this uh, might even be uh, greater than what you saw in the uh, early 90s from the, uh, from the other one, which was pretty meaningful as well. But, uh, well, we did okay that with that, but this will be very interesting. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from Buckhorn from Raymond James. Your line is open. Hey, thank you for the time and uh, quite a bit of news to digest, but thank you so much for, for going through it. Uh, let me back it out to a, just a more of a higher level and, and kind of policy uh, type question for you. We're hearing a little bit more chatter coming out of D.C. Uh, that, uh, that there's some renewed consideration of, of the President Biden's uh, proposal for a $15,000 first-time buyer tax credit and uh, among some other things out there. But I'm just wondering what your thoughts uh, might be on how a tax credit like that could affect the current housing market, you know, would the benefits outweigh the costs? And do you see any other policy options that might be more supportive to uh, increasing housing supply at these levels? So, you know, look, the, uh, the last thing I, I think we should be weighing in on is politics these days. There's no question that stimulus is, um, is a significant part of the equation uh, as I've noted in uh, my remarks, you know, interest rates are still uh, low by all measures. Uh, yes, they've ticked up a little bit, but the other side of the equation is the savings rate and the stimulus that's out there just in the most recent stimulus bill. Additional legislation seems to be coming down the track, and that will once again stimulate even more demand. Uh, the complicating part is that we're dealing more with supply shortage than we are dealing with a shortage of demand. The fact is demand is very, very strong, um, and a tax credit to stimulate more demand, it seems, is probably going to layer on uh, uh, more demand to an already constrained supply, uh, which will probably um, have the impact of uh, raising prices somewhat, uh, uh, just you know, supply and demand imbalance. Um, so, uh, the, you know, the question is, what do you do across a country that is talking about workforce housing and, um, and short supply uh, uh, as, as a governing kind of uh, component? And it seems that there's going to have to be some additional initiative uh, to focus on more land entitlement, uh, more streamlined um, you know, uh, uh, government involvement in constraining the supply. Uh, but we'll have to see how it all shakes out. Uh, as things sit right now, when we look at the housing market, it's one of the reasons that we think that for the next years, uh, the housing market benefits from a fairly strong supply uh, limitation and uh, demand strength, uh, strong demand and, and shorter supply. Um, and for the home builders, we're going to have to be an active participant in finding reconciliation here and participating in building new homes. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, let me uh, follow up with a question on the single-family rental platform, this, this new strategy. Uh, there's a lot of details to, to cover there. So just for clarification, um, would Lennar be the exclusive builder to this new uh, SFR venture? Um, you know, what's the – and kind of what's the initial timeline uh, to ramp up deliveries to this venture, and, and, and would the returns uh, or margins on these homes be similar to the for sale product? So, the, so a bunch of questions there. Uh, right. The duration of the venture is a 12-year period. Uh, it has a four-year investment period. Um, the venture is not exclusive to Lennar, although our, our partners in the venture are very comfortable with Lennar product and, and it's been geared towards buying our new homes. Um, and so what was the last part of your question? Just, just you know, would the returns and margins on, on build for rent product be similar to for sale? Yeah, yes. So let, let, let me say this. It, this is primarily a focused program on Lennar product. We have the ability uh, within the program to, uh, to buy other uh, builders' product as well. But think of it as primarily focused on a new build 
program uh, that is going to be uh, basically opening uh, the ability to purchase across Lenore's platform. That's the exciting part of this program is, uh, is the ability to ramp up. We have already started buying homes into this program. Um, even though uh, the ink is just drying on uh, this, the uh, CenterBridge-led uh, financing component, we had a head start on this program and have started buying homes. Uh, we'll be ramping up pretty considerably over the next year. And you can expect that our margins are going to be a, um, exactly in line with the margins on the rest of our products. Uh, so there will be no pullback or compromise in that regard. Yeah, and, and, and consistent with Stuart's comments on technology and visibility, the, this business allows the venture to have complete visibility across our pipeline to make it very seamless for them to to transact with Lenar. So it's a let me just say one more thing. One of the things that has us most enthusiastic about this program is the social component. This is an upward mobility program. It produces access across Lenar's landscape to a broader array of social and economic um, uh, participants in our communities um, and, and really stretches and gives single-family lifestyle access to a much broader array of the population. Now that's the case for single family for rent in general, but notably in this program, we have a, a component of our program that is dedicated to and focused on um, lease with an option to buy. And we're, we're really focused on finding a way to not only create accessibility to our single family homes um, in our single family for rent program, but also to engage more people in the ability over time to find their way to home ownership, uh, which, I, which we think is a greater good. Uh, so this is an exciting program for the company and I think ultimately for the industry. And we've designed it to be ultimately an industry solution as well. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is from Carl Reichart from BTIG. Your line is open. Thanks. Morning, everybody. Um, I Good just morning. asked one so you can get someone else in here, but Rick or Stuart or whoever, John, if you, if, can you talk about how uh, mix has changed in terms of entry level versus first time move up or even down to next gen? You mentioned that, that folks are looking for larger homes now, uh, more space, and I'm interested if your community count as it changes over the year is going to address that, if you're seeing more demand for higher end homes now compared to, say, six months ago when entry level was a big driver. John, Rick, and yeah. this is John. I'd say that we're, we're seeing consistent demand across our platform. So it's um, you, know, you still have tremendous drive for the, the more affordable homes as people come out of apartments um, and are able to access home ownership for the first time, uh, driven in, in a large part, as we've discussed, by historically low interest rates. Um, but we see it throughout to our, our next gen product, as you mentioned, which is a phenomenal solution for those looking for a, a home that's better suited for working at home, playing at home, educating at home, as well as the need for multi-generational families as America continues to age. Uh, we're seeing continued demand or, or renewed demand in our active adult product line. Um, but if you look at our square footage, you know, which is average at first quarter about 2,300 square feet per home, it's, it's really maintained a very constant level. So even though we have a shift towards you know, more first-time affordable product in our overall mix, um, you can see the impact of the demand for larger homes uh, really balancing out our average square footage across the entire platform. Yeah, but in addition to what John said, consistent as to what we said in prior calls, we are, we are very focused on expanding our entry-level market share, and that's what's been driving, you know, our sales prices down on a consolidated basis, notwithstanding the fact that we're seeing pricing power in that segment. We've really focused on higher returns, higher volume in, in our entry level and first time move up communities. All right. Thanks a lot, Rick. Thanks, John. Thank you. 
Our next question is from Ivy Zelman from Zelman & Associates. Your line is open. Hey guys, good afternoon. It's actually Alan on for Ivy. Uh, congrats on all of the, uh, the exciting things going on and, and the great performance. Um, Thanks, my, my first question, I think uh, you know, a lot's been discussed about all the ancillary businesses, so I'll, I'll probably leave that to the side for now. But um, you know, just in terms of the, the, home, the core home building side, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting last week we saw an announcement from the GSEs about actually capping the, uh, the percentage of second homes and investment properties that they're going to be buying. And I'm pretty sure that's the first real example of, of you know, tightening on the mortgage side we've seen in a while. And, and I know it's a small part of the business, but I'm curious, um, you know, have you looked at what impact that might have on your business? What percentage of your, your sales today are to second home owners or, or uh, investment uh, property uh, owners? And uh, you know, just kind of curious if that differs across your, your footprint. Sure. Uh, good morning, Alan. Uh, this is Bruce. I'll take that question. Um, we're running somewhere in the 8% range and the limitation they talked about was 7%. Uh, so what that means is we'll look to the private market uh, to sell those loans as opposed to the GSEs. Uh, so you know the impact might be a little bit on the margin side within financial services, uh, but we'll still be able to go ahead and uh, offer those loans. We'll just be selling them elsewhere. Got it, very, very helpful there, Bruce. Uh, good to hear your voice. Um, Likewise. Second question. Second question. I guess just on the land side. Um, you know, obviously tying up a lot of land there, and I think you you made the comment about looking towards larger communities so you can kind of uh, keep a higher sales pace going. Um, can you provide any additional color about you know the the underwriting on the land you've tied up over the last year and how that might differ from you know land prior to the pandemic, whether that you know quantifying the number of lots per community absorption rates that you're assuming going forward, um, you know, margins and implied margins on that, any color you can give would be, would be great. Great. Yeah, so from an underwriting standpoint, we're, we're pretty much consistent with where we've been in prior time periods, you know, with the exception of coming out of the downturn where there was a lot of distress out there. You know, from an underwriting standpoint, we're really not focused on underwriting inflation. We're staying very close to where the markets are with regard to sales prices and pace. Uh, we have a lot of metrics right now with regard to what current activity is. Um, and as Stuart, I, and John talked about, we're really matching duration risk to risk-adjusted return for the various programmatic structures we've got. And what I would add to that is we have an intense focus because of our production first strategy to looking for land that uh, fits existing product that we build so we can maximize the reuse of product, uh, which really creates efficiencies throughout the system, as you can imagine, for both us internally and all of our trade partners. Gotcha. So just to clarify, though, on the absorption comment, because I think you said you know, you're, you're kind of looking at today's absorption. So is, is this four and a half per per month range that you're kind of running at? Is that the right way to think about how you anticipate the, the pace staying over the next you know, X number of years as these projects come online? Because that's obviously much higher than, than the cycle average. I'm just curious if there's any um, you know, haircut being implied there on the new land. So as we look at land in general, uh, absorption pace actually changes depending on the community. And what we found is in our larger communities, we can have multiple product lines going at any point in time, so the pace is a bit higher. Uh, but we're not we're not forecasting across the board a four and a half, of, you know, you know, over the next several years. It's really geared to what the oper the land opportunity is and the drivers of the the local market there. It, let, let me just say let me just say that I I, I think that we've noted that we could tune up or down the actual sales pace in any of our communities right now. Demand is just that strong and has been that strong. In terms of underwriting, uh, we tend to conservatize that sales pace, uh, recognizing that you know, we can get away with ourselves if we start you know, anticipating that it's much higher. Uh, so we really haven't, um, we haven't tuned up the, uh, the, the sales pace uh, though we could achieve it, um, and we're probably underwriting to something closer to a four, uh, even though we're running at four and a half right now. 
And uh, so maybe that gives some guidelines as to how we're thinking about land. Yeah, that, that, that's very helpful. I appreciate that, that extra color. Uh, great, guys. Good luck. Okay, thank you. And why don't we take one more question? Thank you. Our last question comes from Michael Rehat from J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Good morning, Michael. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for, for squeezing me in. I think this is the uh, second time I got the, uh, the squeeze in before the, the door closes, so I appreciate it. Um, we'll have to make you first next time. <laughs> I, 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 won't, I, I, won't, I won't argue with that. Um, you know, Stuart and, and, and team obviously appreciate all the detail and the results. I, I wanted to ask, um, you know, two quick questions. Um, um, you know, one operationally on the home building side, and, and one uh, see if there's any way to squeeze out a couple more numbers on the on the spin. Um, you know, on the sales pace side, um, in particular. You know, you guys have been very consistent in your um, uh, approach to managing pace and, you know, where possible, perhaps getting a little bit more on the margin side. Um, you know, and I, I think that strategy really uh, comes home in, in an environment today where rates are rising, um, which everything else equal would lower the true, what I'm kind of referring to recently is, you know, theoretical level of demand, um, at, because certainly, as you said, your sales pace is below that level. You could run a lot hotter if you choose. And so, you know, in that type of dynamic, you would think that if, if rates going higher, you know, impair overall market demand, but you're running below that, you should be able to still maintain a pretty steady business and a pretty steady um, you know, order inflow. Um, so, you know, obviously we're just in the initial stages of this rate rise, but I was wondering if that theory um, is, um, is accurate in that, you know, over the last, you know, throughout the uh, first quarter, particularly uh, February and into March, given again that you could have run a lot hotter, in other words, below true market demand, that, um, you know, the recent move in rates really hasn't impacted you at all from a, uh, uh, you know, from the order uh, cadence. So, look, I think, I think, Mike, the way to think about it is uh, I think that there tends to be a knee jerk that interest rates move up and the home builders are, uh, you know, going to have uh, sales turmoil. Um, and that might be conventional wisdom, but in today's market, as I've noted, there are offsets to the movement in interest rates. First of all, interest rates have, uh, are moving from a historically you know, an abnormally low rate. Uh, we're still lower than we were a year ago. Interest rates are still low, but the offset is the fact that the savings rate in the country is re has really enabled so many more people to be able to afford a down payment. The increase in home prices is on the one hand a negative, but on the other hand a positive in that someone who owns a home who's going to sell their first time home has a bigger down payment for their move up home. Uh, so there's this kind of trickle up, uh, you know, portion of this. Uh, and then stimulus is adding to the availability of capital to support uh, the home and mortgage business. Uh, you might find that interest rates knock some people um, uh, out of the, uh, the uh, uh, credit boxes that are out there, uh, but there's, there's so much demand. The backfill has been uh, pretty readily uh, you know, supportive of maintaining sales pay. So at the end of the day, we've really seen very little trail off in demand. In fact, it's continued to be strong and be building. Um, what has been traditionally a spring selling season um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to detect where the spring selling season is because we've been consistently strong um, all the way through what at this time should be the beginning of the spring selling season. So uh, I think that what I'd say is um, that, uh, that we're, we're still seeing a very strong demand pattern, and even with interest rates ticking up, there are offsets to that tick up that are keeping demand strong. Great. No, I appreciate that, Stuart. Thank you for that. Um, 
you know, secondly, um, and I know you guys are probably fairly reticent, but, you know, with the stock up uh, on today's news, obviously, both on the strong results, but also, I think, on, on the news of the spin, you know, I don't know if there's any other type of metrics you could provide. I think, you know, one of the, the, the key numbers, I guess, uh, was uh, uh, that, you know, the, this uh, tax-free spin would uh, be comprised of 3 to $5 billion in assets with no debt. And, you know, you mentioned, um, obviously, the different uh, businesses that would, um, you know, from which the, the spin could be comprised of with, with LMC being the backbone. You know, I was hoping if it's possible, if, if you kind of take that three to five billion asset range, what would be the corresponding range for liabilities? Um, and and uh, also on the income statement side, any type of corresponding, um, you know, management fees or income that you're deriving from today that's running through your, your income statement as well as uh, on the corporate G&A side. So I don't know if you could give perhaps all those numbers, but even a few would be very helpful. So, you know, as I said, uh, you know, we, we're giving you a skeleton right now. Um, I think that this, my starting point in just giving you some uh, some answer to that is we start with a really strong balance sheet right now. You see a debt to total cap at 24% and, and you know, sizable profitability coming through the year. So you can imagine our balance sheet continues to get stronger. That really enables us to do a spin of a sizable amount of assets with no liabilities associated, meaning no debt. Um, and it leaves us with a balance sheet at Lennar that is just rock solid. Um, so very little impact to the balance sheet. Now from an operating and earnings standpoint, um, you can think um, you know, similarly. Look, we've been building these businesses um, in the background and we've been reporting on them for years. Uh, these businesses um, are up running and have been operating uh, but because of the composition of some of them, like LMC, where you have depreciation and you have, um, you know, third-party management fees and a variety of things, they don't show gap profitability. Deferral. So there's deferral. That's right. You're, you're going to see very little, if any, impact to the earnings of the core company. Um, but these operating businesses, as they stand on their own with their own identified metrics, this enables those businesses to be able to run more effectively and efficiently as a standalone company. This is not about you know, creating some notion of value or anything else. The standalone home building financial services group and the standalone asset management business is the right configuration for these businesses on a go forward basis. Um, and you'll see very little impact to Lennar's, the Remainco bottom line. And an exciting value proposition and standalone enterprise for Spinco as it stands on its own. That's the structure, that's the skeleton, it's as far as we can go right now, but all of this is driven by the fact that we have a balance sheet that supports, we can give this kind of a strong um, uh, spin or dividend, as you might think of it, um, without impacting the underlying balance sheet and building two or, or furthering two very strong companies on a go-forward basis. And I would just say, um, Mike, as you think about this, remember, Lennar has done this before. In 1997, we spun LNR, um, and we did it in a very carefully constructed manner where it was two separate businesses that were longstanding and we identified and, and, and ran both companies uh, to, for, you know, in, a, in a very successful manner. And we expect to be doing some of that uh, similarly all over again. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, you bet. Listen, uh, I know that this has been a lot to absorb and we've run over time, but I thought it was worth the time to do that. Um, uh, we look forward to continuing to update you on all elements of our business and uh, look forward to a strong 2021. Thank you for joining.
Thank you all for participating in today's conference. You may disconnect your line and enjoy the rest of your day.